Hello everyone, welcome to RMIT Activator's Launch Hub 11 Showcase. We are streaming live today from RMIT Activator. My name is Tim Ottaway, I'll be your MC tonight. I'm the co-founder of Project Flock, a startup that is focused on making cycling safer and I'm also an alumni from last year's um, Launch Hub program in 2020. As an, as an Activator founder myself, I can say it's been a ride getting to this point. And it's, a fan, and it's fantastic to finally see some faces in the room tonight, as well as those of you joining us here online. After 12 weeks of incredibly hard work, our group of fantastic founders, which are here, here with us tonight, of course, are ready to pitch their impact-driven businesses. Thank you so much for joining us tonight to celebrate their successes. All right, so let's lock in and give our full attention to the founders. They're an amazing mixed bag, and we're in for a really great night of, of pitches. Before we dive into the showcase, I would like to acknowledge the people of the Woiwurrung and Bunurung language groups of the Eastern Kulin Nations, on whose unceded lands we conduct the business of the university and for where I'm joining you today. All right, let's get started. Not only have we got some great pictures from our founders this evening, but we will also be joined by our judging panel, who's on my left here tonight, who will be looking for the best pictures of the night. Our judges are Charlie McDonald from Giant Leap, We've got Katie Higgins from Luna, and we've got Millicent Brealey from Blue Rock. The best, pitch, the best pitch tonight will be taking home the following prizes. We've got 12 months of monthly one hour mentorship sessions with Blue Rock. We've got fees waived for card transactions up to a processing volume of $40,000 Australian from Stripe. Two hour, um, the, the third thing here we've got is a two hour mentoring session with Luna. And lastly, to cap off this brilliant prize for the best pitch of the night, is tickets to Startup Victoria monthly events. So as a founder, I'd say one of the best parts of, of the Launch Hub um, program are the coaches. They play a pivotal role in helping the founders on their journey, so it's my honour to introduce the coaches for Launch Hub number 11. We have Ian Wong, who is the co-founder and vice president of Circular Economy, um, Victoria, we have say oh sorry, Ian's over there. Um, Senki, um, Sengita Mulchandani, uh, founder of Jumpstart Studio, and finally our last coach who's been helping these amazing founders uh, these these last few months is Shamila Gopalan, um, the founder and CEO of Herwit, and also the co the the the, the co-founder co of Mechanics of Scale. I'm looking forward to hearing from all of you soon, judges. Good luck. Along with our judges awarding the best pitch tonight, we're actually going to be calling on you at home to help decide who gets the People's Choice Award. You will find the voting link in the chat box. The winner of the People's Choice Award will receive a two hour mentoring session with Luna and tickets to Startup Victoria's monthly events. All right, so lastly, before we get to the pitching, I'd like everyone to please help to celebrate and encourage our founders during the event tonight in the chat section to your right. Okay, it's time to kick off the pitches, but first we'll hear from Ian Wong, who's one of our coaches, to introduce the first batch of the pitches tonight. Take it away, Ian. Thanks a lot, Tim. <clears throat> How great is it to be here face-to-face, -face, live? No, this is uh, my fifth, fifth launch hub, and I think this is my first launch hub showcase where I actually get to be outside of my pajamas <laughs> and wearing t uh, wear a proper shirt. I actually had a blazer, but it's a little bit hot here. Uh, so as Tim said, I'm the co-founder and vice president of Circular Economy Victoria. Um, this is our second time that we're partnering with RMIT Activator around impact ventures and very proud to do so. In addition to being um, the vice president of Circular Economy Victoria, I'm also on the board of the Yarra Riverkeeper Association and Botanic Gardens Foundation, so have a real keen interest in impact. I also come from a background of the corporate world, and this is again why these impact ventures are really interesting for me. Um, I was the partner in IBM and led their strategy and innovation uh, consulting practice for Australia and New Zealand. And um, every single one of these, um, of, of, of the, uh, uh, I guess, businesses are impact ventures, and I really enjoyed working with every single one uh, in, uh, that I've coached in creating a safe and just world where everyone can thrive 
in balance with our planet. And so without further ado, I will introduce our first startup or our first business. Nat uh, showed great grit and determination through this entire process. We had our ups and we had our downs, as you always do. There's the romance of entrepreneurship and then there's reality of entrepreneurship. And Nat and I really endured through the reality of entrepreneurship, and she's done a great job to get to this point. So Nat, come on up from 3D and Circular, come on up for your pitch. When I was five years old, I used to go to a local fashion factory where my nonna worked and help her. And as a reward, I would get a box of scraps, pre-consumer waste that were swept off the cutting room floor. It was then, and I'd make doll outfits, and it was then that my obsession with pre-consumer textile waste started. So, fast forward 40 years. My son asked me for money for a skin and kind of thought, what is he talking about? So I realised that I, he wanted me to dress his virtual avatar. So that got me thinking, why in fashion do we not have uh, 3D prototyping as best practice as in architecture or automotive? Six, six million tonnes of pre-consumer textile waste from the fashion industry goes to landfill globally. 35% of material is lost in the sampling and cutting and production of garments. 4% of global greenhouse emissions come from the fashion industry. That makes it the second largest polluter. And today, eco-conscious Consumers are demanding that we create fashion brands that create sustainable, more sustainable garments. The 3D Circular and platform delivers values and systems evolution, starting with phase one, a 3D and circular education platform, which will provide knowledge to organisations to educate their workforce about 3D prototyping and circular economy. This will help them transition to net zero and reduce costs. The 3D and circular platform sorry, will reduce waste, ena enable onshoring and aid net zero transition and create local jobs. The 3D circular platform, three revenue streams are phase one, education revenue, which will be based on per course fee, phase two, a 3D circular microfactory revenue um, based on cost per sample, per garment and per microfactory licensed. And in phase three, a 3D circular network revenue um, based on a global online platform subscription. Um, so, I still apologise. Um, so, just to let you know um, a little bit about where, what the, um, I think I've done. <laughs> Thank you, sorry. Uh, thanks, Nat. I'm happy to kick off. Um, so if I'm understanding correctly, there's an there's a element here around the 3D modelling and then enabling the clothing manufacturers to use those 3D models to, to make clothes that are both um, more sustainably designed, but also fit fit for purpose. Is that is that kind of correct? Yes. So basically, up to fifteen samples can be made when sampling a garment. So in the production process or design and development process, um, so it's eliminating the pre-consumer samples um, from prototyping to pre-production samples. But then it's also helping optimize patterns. So it's actually taking away, um, you know, help going to a more zero waste. So that jacket there, that's a zero waste jacket. That was our prototype we took to NGV Melbourne Design Week um, in which we used dead stock fabric and we were able to actually create a garment without any waste at all and go straight to production. Fantastic. And how do you intend to find the, um, the retailers that are interested in, in purchasing these kinds of products? Sure. We just went through the process of applying for CBIC, um, in which we had um, we approached 50 different companies. Um, one was a uniform company that worked for, which was um, had a client which was Vic Roads. So um, we, we're looking for local manufacturers to work with um, because we see that's where the value is. 
Um, we also see this platform as being able to onshore manufacturing here in Australia. Fantastic, thanks. That was great. Well done. Thank you. Um, I'm keen to learn a little bit about you and if there's anyone else on your team that's helping you. Yes. Uh, well, this is the journey that we went through. <laughs> um, so I started the Activator with a partner. She's a 3D um, designer. Um, and we met through NGV Melbourne Design Week in which I started. I wanted to create a workshop around 3D prototyping and circular design. Um, and so it was from that we actually realised there was an opportunity. So we've been working with clients in Melbourne. We've already got um, five clients that we work with. Um, some of them are mainly smaller brands that we've been able to sort of leverage in that area there. It's very hard to go into big brands um, because of structure in the business. And yes. Amazing, thanks. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Matt. Well done. Uh, I'll give it to the next person. Okay, so next up, I'd like to introduce Sam from CryptoCycle. Um, again, another interesting journey. And I really enjoyed her structured and focused approach to the way she immersed herself in a particular industry. At first, we start looking at solving the world's problem and realize that's not how you start a business. You actually start a business by being very focused. So. Um, Sam, come up and uh, pitch and tell us about the story. Thanks a lot. I'm Sam, a reward for waste app incentivizes reuse and recycling, keeping items in the circular economy for longer. Our vision is to move from waste to worth. As the world races to net zero, businesses are under immense pressure to track their targets, yet 95% of plastics are being thrown away after a single short use. Let's talk about beer. The beer industry in Australia is valued at $4.6 billion, with 85% produced onshore. The independent market is growing as we're looking for quality and sustainability. Many brewers use these really cool can clips. They're made of 100% recycled content, they're reusable and they're recyclable, but not in our bins at home. To tackle this problem, the Independent Brewers Association and industry partners have come together to trial an in-store can clip return scheme with brewers reusing these clips. We see an opportunity with Reward for Waste to incentivize the can clip return scheme. Unique coding at manufacture or along the supply chain provides brewers and retailers with an amazing opportunity to engage with their consumers, sharing their story, their product provenance and their sustainability values. Consumers scan the unique code on the clip scan the return point in store and then receive rewards, connecting them with their environmental impact as they see their rewards grow. Reuse is tracked with AI and green blockchain technology, bringing traceability, transparency and immutability, building trust and dispelling concerns around greenwashing. Reward for Waste unlocks the value chain and accelerates positive behavioural change. Our B2B revenue model has three parts. The scheme owner funds IT development, consultancy, and passes on a transaction fee. Refurbished clips are sold to brewers at a reduced cost, and then we're looking at a subscription model to provide data insights. App downloads lead to engagement, which leads to more clips being returned, reducing the cost for brewers. Every clip reused saves on, <coughs> saves, um, on energy and resources. Um, and reduces waste and CO2. With RMIT, we've validated our market entry point and we've uh, validated our product market fit by speaking with major retailers, brewers and consumers. With 75% of consumers saying they would return packaging back to store if they're incentivized to do so. Our next steps are to look to do a feasibility trial and then to scale and then to run a full implementation of the scheme with multiple brewers across multiple states. There's amazing growth opportunity. Any item that can be coded can be brought to life with reward for waste. If you'd like to know more, we'd love to get in touch with you, either here or in the UK. Thank you. That was great, well done. 
Um, I can see your co-founding team is based in the UK. Is the plan to predominantly roll it out in here in Australia or will it be kind of across the jurisdictions? Okay, so the can clip is, um, well, we've started over here in Australia. In the UK, they're looking at other products. They're looking at things like the um, digital deposit return scheme mm -hmm. um, and they're looking at various other things. So the idea is to start this here and to uh, roll it out as, as, as far as we can. Um, uh, but yeah, there's, there's, you know, any item that can be coded can be traced with reward for waste and consumers get, get rewards for that. Amazing. Did you? Thanks so much for the pitch, Samantha. My question is just to, um, uh, to give us a picture of what happens when this um, solution does not exist. What, what happens to those clips when I put it into my recycling bin instead of putting it into one of these, um, these buckets in store? Okay, so um, the material recycling facilities don't always recognise these. They're made of HDPE and they recognise the big milk jugs, but the smaller plastics they don't recognise, especially the ones that are darker colour because the infrared light doesn't pick up um, particularly the black colour. So a lot of them are ending up in landfill. Thanks. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks a lot, Sam. That was great. Hey, next up, I'd like to introduce Zeda from La Guapa. Um, <clears throat> so with her, I got to exercise my interest in luxury fashion, and that's always a great exercise. Um, and um, really are, enjoyed our conversation around sustainable fashion and ethical fashion, and it's a really important uh, cause. So. Um, and we need more businesses in that area. So, uh, Zeda, how about you come up and give us our, your pitch? Yeah. Oh, hi, my name is Zaida, and I am the co-founder of La Wap Outwear. I am a fashion designer, and I am super passionate about sustainability. La Guapa is a sustainable outwear brand. Our mission is to create a fashion brand that is unique, trendy, yet kind to the environment, to support local manufacturers and to educate consumers on the negative effects of fast fashion and the importance of going slow. We created, we turned the use of vintage and desktop fabrics into a point of value and differentiation. The fashion system is broken. For so long, we have prioritized profits over the environment of people. The fashion industry fits a culture of overconsumption, waste, and also they exploit the garment workers. Our approach to sustainability is 360 degrees. We use the stock fabrics, our buttons are made from recycled polyester, our uh, packaging is uh, compostable, our manufacturer is based in Melbourne, and they are an, ethic and an accredited ethical manufacturer. We offer customization into the jackets, like embroideries and costume labels. Research shows that when consumers are involved into the designing process, they develop a connection with the garment and they will keep it forever. The global ethical fashion market is growing rapidly. It is estimated that it's going to reach 8.3 billion by 2025. Outerwear is a fast growing fashion category. According to data from WGSN, retailers are stocking more um, coats and jackets. They are stocking uh, coats and jackets by 48%. We have made a lot of progress. We launched a successful Kickstarter campaign. We were the finalists on the Good Stuff Awards by Frankie. Um, we sold out our first collection of jackets made of vintage wool blankets. Um, we uh, launched a masterclass and an ebook in sustainable fashion. Uh, we are developing a website where you can customize the jackets. And uh, we have uh, been contacted by Renew Australia, and we're going to have a store in Docklands. Our impact is the reduction of textile waste and the consumer knowledge on sustainable fashion. The way we measure the impact is by how many kilos of textile waste we save from the landfill, the reduction of carbon emissions, and how many ethical jobs we create. Our goal is that by 2025, we will save 400 kilos of textile waste, we will create 20 ethical jobs, and we will become 
100% carbon neutral. Our expected annual revenue will be 2,160,000 Australian dollars. Please help us create a change where the change where la guapa. Thank you for that, Zayda. Um, sounds like you've got a good projection, um, which is great. Uh, I guess I just wanted to ask about um, your reusing or recycling um, polyester and textile waste. Yeah. In terms of the circular economy of that, I guess eventually we don't want any of that waste out there. Yeah. Um, so how will, once we remove that waste in the economy, how will um, the brand continue? Okay, so in a perfect world, I think we still phase out uh, totally uh, polyester because they're microplastic, because they're carbon intensive, it just needs to go out. So right now I am trying to use natural materials, like for example, the um, blankets are made of uh, vintage, uh, they're made of wool. And yes, I think uh, the best solution will be to phase out polyester and just to start using natural fibers. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks so much, Seda. Um, it's such a beautiful jacket. I want to get up there and wear it. Um, Thank you. The, the, the question I have is that there are so many, um, there are so many individual brands coming into the sustainability space. Um, it looks like your model is is going to be B to C primarily. Is that is that correct, or are you going to do some um, distribution through wholesalers as well? Well, right now you are, we are a direct-to-consumer um, brand, but uh, in the future I will consider to. Um, do wholesale with retails that they align with our values. Fantastic. And um, with the, I saw you had a collection sold out. Congratulations on that. That must okay. be a good feeling. Um, yes. what, what are you seeing in terms of, I guess, because the, the competitive pressure typically puts pressure on costs of acquisition. Um, what kind of costs was of acquisition were you looking at um, compared to, I guess, the average basket value? If, if this is to detail of a question, happy to happy to leave it. But ba basically, what 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 costs of acquisition were you looking at um, for uh, sales through the website to date? Uh, cost of acquisition. You mean in terms of having a retail or sorry, I don't understand the, your question. The, really the well. marketing expense per sale. The marketing expense per sale. Mm. I don't really know how to answer all, that question. All good. We can we can take it offline. That's fine. <laughs> <laughs> sorry. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks. Great presentation. Thanks a lot, Zeta. Um, so last of the uh, startups that I, or businesses that I coached, is Biophilic Soundscape. Um, we have a shared passion, so Nadine and I have a shared passion for ecological restoration, and a lot of our conversations was, let's try to find the commercial value proposition, because we know the solution definitely has an ecological um, impact. So Nadine, how about you come up and explain this startup to us? How can we mitigate climate change and improve livability and biodiversity by transforming motorways noise barriers? The problem is systemic. An increase in population led to an increase in motorways infrastructure, which again led to an increase in air pollution, in noise annoyance, and an increase in heat island effect, which had very negative consequences to biodiversity and livability. However, the federal government is spending over $110 billion on to improve and to extend this infrastructure. Our customer, who are the construction corporations need to be competitive to actually with, you know, win these tenders, but in the same time now they have to prove to reduce carbon footprint and they have to actually respond to sustainable development goals from the United Nations. I'm Nadine Samaha. I'm the co-founder of Biophilic Soundscape. I specialize in biophilia, which is the inner need of human to connect with nature and with everything's living. Together with my co-founder, Dr. Jordan Lacey, who specializes in soundscape design, we are proposing a simple solution which is holistic by introducing biophilic buffer and corridors 
to improve air quality, to, Im to actually transform noise into pleasant soundscape, and to mitigate climate change. This is in order to provide um, a positive social and environment impact for all our beneficiaries. Through the Launch Hub, we've been very fortunate to actually uh, produce a 3D model, 3D print model, where we can have an insight on how to, um, how to test the solar panel performance, how to uh, measure as well the absorption to endemic dense vegetation, all the air pollution, just to name a few, which really led us to establish our solution-based uh, business model where we will be designing, manufacturing for assembly our product. So it's going to cost about $1,980 per linear meter, on average about four meter noise barrier high, and with the possible revenue of $19.8 million for 10 kilometer stretch. From here, we are looking at building a two by four meter prototype where we will be still exploring and testing our solution, while partnering with others in the industry who are interested in our product. From there, we'll be building a 20 meter long prototype on a motorway, and then from there, we'll be scaling it up to stretch over kilometers. Please reach out if you're interested to discuss this opportunity further, and thank you so much for listening, and thank you for MIT Activator. <laughs>Thank you for that. that well, I'm sure that it will look amazing. I just had a few quick questions that might just be for my own interest, but will the walls require much maintenance? And um, I just wasn't sure, are the plants real plants? Uh, they are real plants, and they've been picked up today from my walk, and they're all indigenous. So. Oh, amazing. <laughs> yeah, yeah, so, so that's why they've been able to hold up till now. I sprayed them a little bit, but they're fine. Yeah, oh, fantastic. Yeah. So then I guess I'm just wondering, once there might be 10 kilometres or more stretches yeah. of this, what sort of the maintenance requirements to keep these going? And are there any yeah. um, interested parties, you know, is the government that will be required to um, look after these um, spaces? Yeah, there will be Yeah, there will be definitely maintenance. And whenever we spoke to uh, people like Major Project Victoria or TMR as well in Queensland, they always showed that really, that concern. However, any, you know, any walls that you're going to be putting needs as well maintenance, particularly over the years with concrete panels which have been broken and really been fallen as well. Yeah, there will be need, it will need maintenance, but mainly because we're going to be using special planting um, and really with special medium. So it will be actually not needing too much maintenance after a year once it's established. But it wouldn't be more than any other maintenance than anything okay. else. Yeah. yeah, great. And we're talking to other people in the industry who have been proven this, so we're looking at that more further. Amazing. Thank you. Thanks for your question. Um, amazing. Thanks. You might have already touched on this, but what councils and government have you been speaking to and where is the trial? Where are you planning to roll it out? Um, well, we've been speaking, we spoke before with Major Project Victoria. We had interest from TMR in Queensland. And uh, we've been speaking now recently as well with Mott McDonald, who are really doing now um, motorways in uh, noise barrier actually in Adelaide. So the planting is going to be adapted to whatever the area is. So you have to use the endemic planting. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, we've been discussing as well with Jungle Fi, with Cole Hauer, who are new on the market, who are really very interested as well in the product. Cool. Yeah. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you to the founder for those fantastic pitches. It's incredibly difficult coming out of COVID to, to sort of jump up on the stage here and, uh, and do stuff you know, face to face and, and also live uh, streaming to the internet. So really great job to those, those first batch of founders. We've still got some more pitches to come, but um, first just a little bit more info. This is the 11th Launch Hub cohort that's come through the RMIT Activator. And it's themed around, if you haven't already picked up on it, it's themed around impact ventures. The successful, co -found, uh, the success, the successful founders were chosen for their startup's potential to make a change in the world with ideas based around emerging technologies like blockchain, uh, maximizing social well-being, and new, uh, new approaches to support COVID-19 recovery, and much more. 
And to tell you a bit more about Launch Hub and RMIT Activator, I would like to welcome Matt Salia, Director of RMIT Activator, who unfortunately couldn't make it here tonight, but we have him uh, speaking from home. Well, Manjika, everyone. Hi, Matt here, Director of RMIT Activator. I'm a bit bummed I can't be with you there in person tonight. So I'm coming to you from the land of the Ghana people over here in Adelaide, and I'd like to pay my respects to those elders past, present, and emerging. Well, all the border opening and the testing matrixes and just plain life busyness being what they are, I'm just not able to be there with you tonight in person. But we know there's a great showcase. We've already seen part of it and I can't wait for the next part. I'm really looking forward to seeing how far all of our wonderful startups and founders have come. Activate is really the entrepreneurial beating heart of RMIT and we're here having spent a lot of time this year refining all of our programs, something we felt was really important at this stage of our own startup journey. Activate has been around for nearly five years now, and look out, listen for our birthday party plans in 2022, you're all invited, and for over three years in Vietnam. And being the heart of innovation, entrepreneurship, creativity, we really take um, that seriously. It takes focus to keep, keep hard on that. We help students, staff, and alumni create startups, connect to the university to industry, and in everything we do, we strive to create the most entrepreneurial talent across all disciplines of the university. From the founder and startup programs like Launch Hub tonight, through the rich array of experiences we deliver students in accredited courses while they study, it's all about changing behavior at scale, embedding entrepreneurial thinking across the whole university and ultimately our broader community. So we're really excited about the cross-pollination of the experiences and how the serendipity of connections and the collisions of ideas can lead to some incredibly special opportunities. And thank goodness we're able to do it back in person again, at least in the main. So we're here to talk about Launch Hub tonight and most importantly, here to talk about the amazing founders and startups from the first of whom you've just uh, just seen from. The theme of Impact Ventures is something really close to my heart. I think having the ability to bring the full power, the weight of the university's uh, capabilities to drive impact to ventures and founders that really want to address some of the biggest challenges in the world is a really meaningful endeavor. And I'm, I'm so excited to see the cohort of amazing people uh, here tonight. 75% female founders, and we've got people from their 20s to their 80s. You know, many of them have validated their ideas through customer reviews. They've built partnerships both in RMIT and outside of it. And they've also developed prototypes and MVPs. For some, this is including growing their revenue and building out their customer base. So exactly what we want to see from what we think is a pretty stellar pre-accelerator in Launch Hub. Of course, a program like this has a lot of people to thank. It takes a lot of moving parts. And of course, from the brilliant coaches and facilitators, Ian, Shamila and Sangeeta, we, we couldn't do it without you once more. To our supporters and partners from Circular Economy Victoria, from Blue Rock, from Luna, Startup Studio, from Cake Equity, AWS Startups and our own internal legal team led by Beck Torp, all these people and all these organizations make what you see tonight come to life. Our Activator Capital Board, who will be having the difficult job in a few weeks of uh, listening to the pitches and, and thinking about the, the allocation of grants. Caitlin, Derek, Adam, Leonard, Kate, you've all been more involved in this program and I'm keen to keep an eye on these pitches tonight uh, so that you really have a sense of where these guys have come from and where they're potentially going. To the talent facilitators and delivery team in my own team in Activator One and Eugenia, you've guided the teams through the past 12 plus weeks. And of course, that's an incredibly, um, incredibly tough job, but you've done it so well and always with a smile. Of course, the rest of the Activator team, and especially our marketing and events and logistics team that made tonight happen, led by Steph's steady and calm hand, you've brought the program together really well and excited to, to see it coming to life. As a team, we're absolutely committed to pushing the boundaries of what's possible and helping those emerging entrepreneurs like these founders to do the same, growing and leading the industries of the future. We can only begin to imagine. Our next Launch Hub program is now open. So please feel free to spread the message far and wide so you know we're very keen to see that same diverse group of founders come through. We'd love for you to forward it on to anyone you think might benefit from being part of this Launch Hub experience. 
And finally tonight, I wanted to highlight something that we're really excited about. We're calling for applications for our first micro accelerator, which is made possible by the Jack NASA Innovation Fund. Now, Jack was an RMIT alum. He's all, he was the CEO of BHP as well as the CEO of the Ford Motor Company in the US. So, you know, fairly quite achiever. But he's generally given, given, generously given funds for a range of activities we've used in the past from boot camps for students and hackathons and scholarships. But over the last nine months, we've worked with him to reshape that into a really catalytic grant program. $15,000, four $15,000 grants a year, entirely equity free, open to all RMIT student staff and alumni who are developing those impact businesses, those businesses that want to change the world. Jack himself is personally passionate about that and is really excited to see what's possible. So the program's now open, please have a look and once again, share widely and, and see if this program might even be for you. Well, that's it from me. Have a wonderful night. I'm disappointed I can't be there with you tonight, especially for the post-pitch party drinks, but I'm really excited about all the startups we're seeing. Back to another one of our amazing founders and now our, our, our erstwhile MC, Tim. Thanks, Tim. Take it away. Thanks, Matt. All right. We're now ready to get into the next round of the pitches that we're holding here tonight. Just a reminder to please keep the comments coming in in the chat and help cheer on our, co uh, our founders tonight. Also, remember to keep track of your favorite pitch tonight so they can go into the draw for the People's Choice Award, which is chosen by you at home. Next up, we have one of our awesome coaches, Sangeeta, to induce our next batch of founders pitching tonight. Thanks, Sangeeta. Thank you. Hi, everybody. Um, my name is Sangeeta Multanani, and I'm the founder of Jumpstart Studio. At Jumpstart Studio, I help corporate professionals become entrepreneurs and become first-time founders, help them transition smoothly into this great world of entrepreneurship. I love entrepreneurship because I was a corporate professional myself 15 years ago, uh, for 15 years, and then started my own businesses in travel and food and consulting, and then founded Jumpstart Studio because I found a lot of entrepreneurs needed support to get into the entrepreneurship space with the right mindset, strategy, and execution. I'm here at Launch Hub today for the first time as a founder, as a coach, because I love working with founders. And for me, entrepreneurs are people who are creators. They are the ones who have the power to change the world. And that's exactly what the next four businesses that I introduce to you are doing today. The first business that I want to introduce to you is called Billy Bubbles. And the founder is William Sheldon. William is an amazing, amazing customer-centric founder. He's probably the one customer-centric customer founder that I've ever seen in my life who goes above and beyond. And that is the secret to his success. So introducing William Sheldon from Billy Bubbles. Thank you, Sangeeta. Owning a soda water maker at home is a great way to reduce your impact, whilst also having something a little fun to drink at home. But if you've ever run out of gas, you'll know how difficult it is to get a refill. The vision for Billy Bubbles is to bring circular services into every household in Australia. The problem with that, though, is that customers often find it too difficult to use circular services because often the experience relies too heavily on the customer. My aim is to change that. And to prove that I can change that, I've started with Billy Bubbles. Billy Bubbles' entry point is in the soda water maker industry because 245 million single-use plastic bottles were reduced by soda stream users in 2018 alone. But did you know that 15% of soda gas cylinders never actually get returned? To understand that problem, you just need to look at the existing customer journey. For $19 a refill, customers have to take their empty cylinder into a store and exchange it at the front counter in order to get a refill. For Billy Bubbles customers, they just pay $10. They book their refill online and leave it by the front door. That's all they have to do because Billy Bubbles does the rest. Like any good business, Billy Bubbles has a special source that can't be replicated. And that special source comes from social and environmental impact being embedded in its values. From those values, several different initiatives come into play. Uh, for example, nothing is used once at Billy Bubbles. From the caps that come on the cylinders to all of the materials used within the supply chain, nothing is used once. Another great initiative is that free repairs are offered on all makes of soda makers. This is to help customers repair rather than um, discard their soda streams. I started the company in July last year, and that was just as something to fail fast. But what the community has done is they've really got behind it and made it something bigger than I could ever imagine. Already, I'm helping customers save 2 million plastic bottles from waste a year. 
in the last six months have acquired 2,200 customers, and 48% of my customers have returned at least four times. All of this when I only launched my online store a couple of weeks ago. Start, uh, sorry, launching Billy Bubbles on day zero meant that a lot of the foundational work that goes into building a business kind of lacked a little bit. So Launch Hub has been really good in identifying those gaps and helping me build on those uh, foundations to help me uh, to help set myself up for growth in the future. So uh, together we've worked out Billy Bubbles financials, which are looking pretty good at the moment. Um, we're now testing a new business model with customers, and whilst we're speaking to those customers, we're also testing the desirability of a new product. My business doesn't end with the program today, though. There's lots of great things on the horizon. First off the rank will be the new business model, which will be launched early next year. And hopefully by the end of the year, I'll be uh, fulfilling the requests that I'm getting from all of the customers that are missing out by launching in a new city. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, William. That's right. Um, it looks really good. One quick question I had. So it looks like um, with the market testing or the traction that you've got through the program mm -hmm. is about 48%. Um, I guess I'm I'm just wondering, like, how quickly does the refill work? Like, if I'm thinking if I was to use it myself, I've mm -hmm. put my empty bottle out the front, what's the turnaround time to get the yep. refill? Um, so I'm delivering in the inner suburbs of Melbourne four nights a week. Um, so that's just to keep the, keep the logistics small whilst I'm still in my infancy. Um, and then that'll be expanding to hopefully be five days a week um, in the near future. Oh, great. So pretty much as, as you start to run low, pop them out the front, book, book in there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And Certainly. it happens maybe overnight or... Yeah, yeah, same, same day. So um, same you, day can, you can book an, an hour before the delivery run. Oh, okay. Yeah. Great, thank great. you. No worries. Uh, thanks so much. Well, yep. my question is around the so th this this is um, an additional service to the SodaStream trend. I'm just <laughs> interested to know um, a little bit more about how big the um, so the penetration of SodaStream mm -hmm. is in Australia. Do you have any insight mm -hmm. into into kind of how popular this is? How it's many kind people of actually have it, a SodaStream. It's a very difficult question because it is uh, you know completely monopolized by SodaStream. It's a private company that um, I don't have the the, um, the figures to look at that kind of market. Um, but I'm just delivering in the inner suburbs of Melbourne. I've already got so many customers already, so it's looking very healthy. Yeah, it's amazing traction so far. Yeah, Congrats. thank you. Um, amazing, and uh, forgive my ignorance, I've never had a SodaStream before. Yes. Is it that you're just targeting SodaStream as a brand at the moment, or is the plan to launch into other um, yeah, so the, the technology or the, the cylinders work in all brands of uh, soda water makers. Mm -hmm. uh, SodaStream is just the pr predominant competitor. And in how many are there out there in Australia? The, the, uh, yeah, a handful yeah. Uh, in terms of companies that make the actual machines themselves. Cool. Yes. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you, William. The next founder that I want to introduce to you is Justin Byrne. Justin is somebody with a big vision, a big vision not just for, for us, but for the entire country and for the entire world. He's solving a problem that is really, really important and very timely. So introducing Justin Byrne from Mimal. Thank you. Good evening. My name is Justin Byrne, and I'm the founder of Mimal. At Mimal, we believe in making the world a better place by finding innovative solutions to increase the actual output of solar panels by floating them over freshwater reservoirs. Burning fossil fuels has caused catastrophic climate change and a trans transition to renewable energy sources is required globally. When solar panels collect the sun's rays and converts them into electrical energy, they're not always efficient due to a number of factors. Did you know that Australia's land-based solar farms miss almost $440 million of revenue each year. Our solution to float grid-scale solar farms over freshwater res reservoirs provides numerous benefits over terrestrial solar farms. The 15% higher efficiency enables operators to produce closer to the nameplate output of their investment. For an average 100 megawatt installation, this would represent about $10 million of revenue each year. For floating solar, also reduces evaporation from our precious water resources by up to 
reduces capital infrastructure, land acquisition and biodiversity offset costs. The shading effect can also protect the water bodies and their inhabitants from increased temperature of global warming. Floating solar has the additional benefit of being able to convert electrical energy directly into green hydrogen at the source. Green hydrogen is a transportable energy dense replacement for liquid hydrocarbons whose only outputs after combustion is water. With greater hydrogen technology, it is hoped that it can be utilised for heating, cooking, transport, heavy industries like steel production and aviation. At Mimmel, we hope to create and build an efficient solar energy capture solution with the ability to power the grid, store energy and transfer to clean green hydrogen. We also believe that the future can look exciting and fun. Through the Launch Hub program, I've learnt the hard way in forging a new and nascent technological idea through the startup arena. It is now my goal to further advance these beachheads through consultation and design to gain support through local government and industry leaders. If you too have a unique power and like to solve problems, please get in touch. Um, amazing, thank you so Thanks. much. Um, I'd love to know a little bit about your background um, before M Mimmel. What did you, what did you do? What did you uh, so I'm a mechanical and petroleum engineer that worked in big industries for a lot of the nasty big players uh, in this game, or on the opposite of the game, I guess. So, and um, yeah, the last couple of years I went and lived in the Tasmanian wilderness, uh, off-grid, completely off-grid, mountain biking, Accidentally ended up on the front cover of a mountain biking magazine. Uh, just a few random odd things. I paint watercolour birds. <laughs> uh, qualified yoga instructor. Uh, um, anything makes, else? No, 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 that's all right. And reason for the name change, I saw. Um, yeah, look, the first one was just a... I dropped a few vowels, you know. <laughs> I thought it was kind of catchy. I was filling out a filling out an application form and needed a bit more time to think something up. Uh, Mimmel actually is an indigenous word for cormorant uh, from the Noongar people, and the emblem is the wings of a cormorant drawing. Very interesting. Um, apologies if you said this in the presentation, but I was just wondering if you are looking to put. Uh, the solar panels on pre-existing water farms or is part of the solution to also create these water farms? Uh, all the ones that you've seen in the presentation are like the major water bodies around Australia. So there's Lake Thompson, which is a major drought storage solution for Melbourne. Um, and it's all about conserving the water that we've already got. Uh, yeah. Building new dams of that size is kind of adverse to the ecology as well, yep. um, a bit more trouble. So trying to save the ones we've got already. Fair enough. Um, and and then I guess a follow on question from that is, um, out of interest, does putting the solar panels on top of the water have any impact to the life within all those the studies? I know, sorry to cut you off. Okay. Um, all <laughs> the studies to date show that there is no adverse uh, effects, and there's a number of reports going. They're looking into so the shading actually keeps the temperature of the water body from increasing a few degrees so they're hoping that by putting these on it's actually gonna save those minute things that people kind of haven't studied yet uh i'm from north queensland originally so i've got a suspicion that barramundi would love these sort of things to yep. uh to hatch and hunt around, so... Yeah, okay. I'm and then in terms of access for the mammals on the shore? Uh, I actually... My design is to keep birds off it so that they oh. don't reduce the efficiency, but mammals... Uh, I don't know if there's too many that will make it out there. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Justin. Next up, we have a very interesting founder. Alfred is somebody who inspires me every single day. And dare I say, he's one of the youngest founders I've ever coached in my life. At 85, Alfred's taking a big step into entrepreneurship, but it's super exciting, and you'll see why. Here's Alfred Zerfus. Thank you. 
with Sing with Fred. You're exaggerating. I'm actually 86. <laughs> uh, uh, it's gone. Oh, here we are. Yeah. Imagine. Imagine all those people. Imagine your elders who are going to be 85 or more at some time of people you know. You know they have a third of a chance of becoming demented. And it's a huge cost to Australia, almost $30 billion in care costs uh, and 170,000 uh, people uh, over 85 have dementia of some sort. So that's, what's the solution? Well, one solution is prevention. And being a, a doctor of epidemiology, uh, I've been working in prevention all my life and I think it's time we had a fresh look at dementia and the prevention is to stimulate memory and social contact. And I'll give you a story about my best friend uh, who was in a nursing home, demented, and I asked the person in charge, what do I do? He said, talk about the old times. So I did that. And he was glum, sitting on the table doing nothing. When I mentioned about the times we had in London, some 50, he jumped up and started eating. So that's the basis of my... Uh, my company, Sing with Fred. It started off actually singing. Oh, there's, there's me with the, the first group, actually. In fact, I met 12 of them at lunch today. So I got a verbal OK, but not, not a survey. Uh, one was a, uh, runs a, uh, is on the um, company of a care hub, uh, one of the chairs. Anyway, this started with singing. And I had some Zooms about a year ago. But I realized, and I congratulate RMIT and the judges in six weeks, because they said, look, it's great, but you're not going anywhere. And then my best friend and my mentor suggested an app. So I figured it's not just the singing that's important, it's the connection. And in, my, in the case of my friend, I didn't have to sing to him. It was just the visual connection through audio. So basically, Sing with Fred has, has, con has continued to be all types of entry points, uh, all five senses, even the crunch of your foot on leaves can bring back a happy memory. So I'm bringing all those five senses, but only one transmission, audio. Because if you go down the street, you see everyone, what are they doing on their phones? Uh, they're listening or talking. So the audio is going to be stored uh, and when they're fresh and there'll be help from their grandkids and the rest of the family, so they'll store the audio of their particular memory that meant something to them. And I've des uh, we've designed an app. Uh, uh, there's a VA from Philippines, my VAR man, uh, and he's charging about 10 bucks an hour, uh, which is good. <laughs> And he got this up in a couple of weeks. So I think he did pretty well. And I'm going to continue with that. So um, it's really getting the input of the memory and getting back the recall. So at a time when they've forgotten about the memory, the family can help them get the recall back. So it'll help prevent dementia or allay dementia when it starts. So that's the whole plan. And uh, look. You can rely on me because I deliver. That's the countries I've worked around the world for UNICEF and other agencies, and I've lectured at five universities. Uh, and uh, you, uh, it's in an early phase, I must admit, but I'll deliver. Uh, the, <coughs> the, um, the, where I am in terms of uh, customer satisfaction, I have to say it's a weakness at the moment. I've just got it verbally from all my contacts, but I'm a member of about 20 or 30 Facebook groups and I attend the Tony Robbins talks and other things as well, so I'm going to use that. The roadmap will be a, a gradual development over time and the revenue will not start coming in probably for at least a year, but I'm, pat I'm willing to be patient about that and I'm willing to contribute 50% of the costs because I think it's so important. So thank you very much, RMIT. Thanks, everyone, and good luck to all of you. Thanks so much, Fred.
what a beautiful um, problem to solve and a story to, to solving it. Um, my, my question is around just understanding a little bit better how to use the app and specifically um, where does the content come from oh, for, okay. for my memories? I'll give you, a, I had an example but I didn't think I had enough time. Uh, I've got a song, um, Where Can I Go? Is There No Place I Can See? It was on a golf course with my mother and my stepfather uh, and it was related to the Holocaust and the diaspora. So it reinforced my feeling of being Jewish and it made me feel good. So the code goes in to the app. It would be golf one, hands one. So any other golf game I had would be with another person. Any other golf game with hands would be hands two. Any other subject would be headed by that. But we're working it out as we go along. And the important thing is that I'm, I'm quite happy about sharing my app with other people. My competition will be collaborators, and there's a huge study going on at Melbourne University with uh, uh, Felicity Baker on this same subject. So I'm willing to uh, contact everyone I can. Amazing, thanks. Thank you. Yeah, thank you again so much. Um, interested because my nana has early onset, not early onset because she's my nana, so I guess she's, her time has come where she uh, is starting to get dementia, so absolutely lovely idea it's fantastic I guess I'm just interested in uh, as you mentioned at the start that to help break out of um, dementia and bring back memories and and whatnot that keeping the brain active and the stimulus is advisable so I'm just wondering is there sort of science behind where just the audio cues are enough to slow it down or bring memories back well there's good evidence for skills and the speed of transmission for a synapse is not related to the nerve, it's related to the myelin around it. And the more you repeat a skill, the thicker the myelin and the faster the connection. If you do it often enough, the myelin is thick enough to, so you remember everything. So I think the same mechanism would probably occur with uh, memory recall, if it's done often enough. Interesting, thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Alfred. Next up is Jackie. Jackie comes from a team of four amazing gamers, and they have a vision to change how you experience your city. So welcoming Jackie from Team Wadu. Oh, hi, everyone. So I would like you to think back to the day when you realized that we were getting out of lockdown. How did you feel? Excited? Nervous? Anxious? Well, I know I was really excited to finally be able to see my family and friends again, but I was also somewhat very anxious because it's been so long since I've been out in the city and about. And I know I'm not alone because lockdown has resulted in a 20% decrease in the movement in Melbourne CBD and a $2.1 billion drop in the Melbourne's nighttime economy. There's also one in three Australian, young Australians, sorry, that experienced high psychological stress in 2021. So the question is this, how might we encourage young professionals to re-engage and rediscover with what Melbourne has to offer? Imagine you're just finishing work in the CBD and you want to explore more, but you don't know what to do. How cool would it be if you could actually explore the, and discover the city in a form of a game? With that, I bring you what do. Wadu presents you with missions that introduces you to activities and places that you've never, you might have never seen or heard before. For example, you're just around the corner in Chinatown and you see a mission that you need to go and visit the Chinese Museum. By completing this mission, you can earn points which then can be claimed for other rewards and activities. But don't worry, if missions aren't for you, you can still use Wadu to explore and discover what's happening around you at the moment. We believe that Wadu would drive social inclusion, promote healthy well-being, support thousands of jobs back into the city, and make Melbourne, Melbourne again. We adopt a freemium pricing model for both our users and businesses, and unlock more, uh, sorry, more exclusive rewards and activities for our users, and customizable events and partnerships for our businesses. Our goal of 50,000 users and 100 businesses will drive a potential revenue of half a million dollars within our first year alone. Over the past 12 weeks, we've conducted over 50 user interviews, 
uh, collected over 100 expression of interest, identified our MVP features, established our branding strategy, and also developed our business model. Our app prototype is actually currently in progress and should be able for testing, oh, sorry, ready for testing in a few months' time. All is super exciting, but we're still at the very, very start of our journey. Over the next six months, we plan to consolidate our feedback and testing so that you can start experiencing the city with Wadu. And while we anticipate for our launch, we've curated our first exclusive launch hub mission just for you. Comment your favorite place in the city or on our latest Facebook or Instagram post by the end of today, and we will pick out a lucky winner to win $50. <laughs> but for now, the next time when you're thinking of what to do, please think of what to do. Thank you. Amazing, thanks. It's like Pokemon Go um, exactly. for the city. I love it. Um, you, I, I'm keen to know a little bit more about the premium features versus just um, regular use. What do you get with the premium features? Yeah, so essentially what we plan is that we're trying to include a lot of gamification. And with gamification, when you pay a little bit extra, you, you'll just unlock a little bit more rewards and all that um, extra gamification in like in-game stuff that may actually engage your gaming experience even more. So we're thinking of maybe rewards like discounts that you can get with certain businesses and that's where we kind of tie in the businesses to come in and their premium uh, model will be helping us to engage this um, rewards section to give back to our users. And yeah, that's essentially um, what we've got so far, but hoping down the track when we discover more and testing with our users, we'll be able to bring more things in. Yeah. Um, I just have one other question. Was there a reason why there was a limit with the target market to just young professionals as opposed to just regular phone users? You yeah. Um, well, the idea is that we want to uh, narrow our target down to begin with. Um, and we are all young professionals at the moment, just graduated out of uni. And um, really, I think the, the reason why we came up with this idea is because there was this one time that we had dinner and then afterwards we were just thinking like, what can we do and what to do? And even with Google, we're still unable to find anything. So. We realize that a lot of the people in our cohort are very similar to that, and we want to start targeting this cohort. But down the track, as more people come in, that we definitely would want to expand our target market. Um, great presentation. Thank love you. love the Pokemon Go <laughs> gamification. Um, my question is is around kind of the tr the thinking behind the business model. So yeah, so, sure. Um, I guess there, there's, it seems like there could be incredible value from <clears throat> the amount of people using this app, particularly yeah. as you gather data for organizations like Tourism Victoria, yeah. I, I think would be um, incredibly interested in, in, in this, but that would occur at kind of volume. So, so interested to understand the thinking that you went the, f the freemium model for users rather than focusing on kind of the referral revenue from businesses and potentially data revenue from other institutions that would be interested. Yeah, um, I think definitely these are things that we haven't really like explored, but I think the first direct thing is the freemium model that we want to ex uh, explore with the users because I think us team, we are gamers ourselves and as direct consumers, there are there is a business model that actually allows us to pay a little bit more just so that we can get a, a whole lot of, um, I think, rewards as, as a result. And um, I think, yeah, first we want to test this one and I think that's a very good point and we might actually consider it for our future, but thank you. Amazing. Thank you, Jackie. Thank you, everybody, for listening to my four amazing teams. And next up, we've got our amazing coach, Shamila Gopalan, to take you through her teams. Hello. I'm very excited to be here. Um, again, this is my third cohort with RMIT. Um, I have to say I have enjoyed this cohort the most. Please don't hate me, the rest of you. Um, but uh, it's, been, it's been an amazing journey through COVID, through this pandemic. Um, just to give you a bit of background about me, for those who don't know me, I am the CEO and founder of Herwit and the co-founder of Mechanics of Scale. And I run a podcast called Unapologetically Brown. I'm sure you can guess what we talk about. Um, with her wit and mechanics of scale, my mission really is to empower and help underrepresented founders 
specifically female founders. So having four amazing female founders to coach this time around is a dream come true. Um, these four founders have had startups or are starting to have their startups across very different segments from food waste to blockchain and NFT, which is the future. And if none of you guys are on it, get on it. Um, as well as mu music, which brings me back to my previous career in entertainment and media for 20 years. So it, it's, that was a joy. And of course, around a very strong cause um, where it's around autism. So my first startup is Net from Fogful. Nat has been a pleasure to work with. She is insightful uh, as well as extremely knowledgeable, uh, knowledgeable about the area that she's going to pitch about, which is hospitality, food waste, and FMB. Hi, um, I'm Natalie from Fogful, and uh, together with my husband, uh, we're Fogful. And a couple of years ago, we became parents. And it was really through this journey that we stopped and evaluated how we were living as a community. And to be honest, it's a really terrifying thought when you realise that if we don't start making a change today, we're not really leaving much future for our kids or our kids' kids. So we're starting here. And this is a big problem. We're looking at 324,000 tonnes of food waste from our food service sector. And that's 666 million meals thrown out annually. About 70% of that edible. And that's the equivalent of food waste equivalent is 7.3% of Australia's greenhouse gas emissions. And financially, that's $4.7 billion that businesses are spending on food that's never prepared or consumed. So our solution is forkful, and it's really simple. A venue shares surplus unsold food on our platform at a discount. And the customer searches using a geographic map to find out what's available near them or near where they're going, and buys through the platform and goes to pick it up. An impact is embedded in what we do. So every time a venue uses Forkful, they're one step closer to reducing food waste. And we make environmentalism easy for customers because every time they use our platform, they're having an impact. And together, these two contribute to an overall broader community change. Now we're in the industry, but we're also customers. So we understand the needs to meet, the necessity to meet both needs. So we were built with knowledge. We've removed roadblocks to make it as easy as possible for venues to use. And our early customer discovery journey told us that venues didn't want to pay any more fees, particularly after COVID, so we removed the fees. And from a customer perspective, we're transparent. We wanted to make sure people knew exactly what they were buying every time. We wanted to make it easy. So you don't need to download an app or create an account to start saving. And our model, well, that's simple too. We make $1 off every meal that we sell and that's embedded into our buying structure. Now, early predictions have us sitting at about a uh, million dollars revenue by 2023 and scaling up to about five million in a couple of years. We're really at the start of our journey and we've got a lot to thank RMIT Launch Hub for. And the end of this program, we've got 20 venues signed up and 150 customer accounts organically created. But most importantly, we've realized that the B2C concept is only one part of what we can do. So we're actually currently using time to map out what our B2B concept looks like. And pretty soon we're entering into the Summer Tech Live program and we're going to use that piece to, to map out what our food insecurity project looks like. By June 2022, we will have done our pilot testing with early adapters and soft launch in one municipality. We'll be looking to scale, test our B2B and re-enter conversations we've been having with the major retail about testing with them as well. Thanks a lot. Thank you, Nat. That's um, okay. Looks like a great idea. Just a few things for my own clarification. Uh, I guess I'm just wondering if I was to say, oh, I haven't got anything for dinner tonight, yep. rather than go to the supermarket, let me jump onto Forkful, see what's available. Um, I guess, can you, within the app, look at something that's nearby? I'm also interested in the traction of people knowing that I can't just go to my supermarket where everything's just there everything yep. that i need sort of what is that traction of people being happy to just go and grab kind of some leftovers and see what they can do in terms yep. of 
having a meal for the yeah night. of course so um we used for, for we we used overseas models when we were living overseas um and looking at them they sold over 100 million meals so in terms of traction from a user base you know i used it myself so i understood why how it worked and why it worked um would i use it here absolutely and that was why we you know we're bringing that same concept here so it is definitely maybe you know my three o'clock you look online you think oh god I haven't got anything for dinner I work in the city I'm going to see what's available or hey I'm going home to Northcote let me see what's available on the way home um, and you buy it and pick it up within an allocated time frame from the venue. Great and then I, I'm just wondering uh, with the venues that are on the app yeah if people if they don't get rid of everything that night is this sort of one day waste only or it can yeah that's, carry on for yeah the next that's day? An interesting concept and that's one that we're kind of looking at what happens to that food that doesn't get sold and is there someone that we can partner with you know there's some really good food recoveries that can turn food waste into other types of so compost for example or mm -hmm. what can we do in that and that's a bit of our, our build and, and what do we do and how do we partner with someone that's already working in that space um, you know, I have a friend who owns a restaurant and, and last time I went in, sorry, he gave me a box of asparagus. And I said, what are you doing this for? He goes, oh, we don't have asparagus on our menu anymore. And I said, but you could turn that into maybe an asparagus risotto and put it on a forkful. Mm -hmm. So it's also about changing a bit of behaviour for people. Yeah. Great. Oh, thank How amazing is Forkful? Like, no more food waste. You can pick up cheap food on your way home. I mean, I'm in. <laughs> so everyone, I hope you got that uh, QR code in place so you can sign up and know when it launches. My next startup is um, Encore. Um, uh, Neil is a phenomenal technologist, but also she comes from a family of musicians which is why this particular platform and app has been launched. I will let her talk to you about it. Hi, I'm Neil, co-founder of Encore, a social impact marketplace that connects musicians with new audiences and enables users to gift musical experiences anywhere in the world. Think of us as Airbnb of the musical industry. The hero of our story is Miguel. Miguel is a talented but struggling musician. Um, during COVID, he had no gigs at all. Even after COVID, he was struggling to find paid opportunities. With dwindling income, Miguel was struggling to make ends meet. There are 80,000 Miguels in Australia alone. Stats show artists worldwide are struggling to stay in the profession. So we have created a niche one-stop digital marketplace where people like Miguel can upload their profile in a matter of few minutes and, and, and customers can find artists for their celebrations anywhere in the world, live or virtually. We have also validated the idea, idea while doing a competitive research. Um, we found out that we have the first mover advantage in Australia in the on-demand live streaming space. Our platform also um, has a great uh, strategy for social impact which is not only the artist where, of course, we provide the source of income um, and bring the community together, but uh, B2B, um, uh, aged care customers are also one of our important customer ways or verticals. And we have realized through music, we are able to elevate um, the mental health uh, implications of COVID with music for these customer bases. Um, then again, the social impact, as I said, we start with social impact and that um, translate onto our business model and revenue model as well. Um, it, the platform is absolutely free for artists um, and we have 22% per transaction for the end customers. We are moving into a model in which um, we will have subscription led business model for our B2B and B2G customers, as well as a small subscription for value added services we offer to our clients. Uh, our end game is to get into augmented reality and our major source of revenue um, is um, planned to be the ad revenue and the tickets and sponsorships. Traction and roadmap. Um, ever since we joined RMIT, we have um, you know, uh, had 100 plus RS signed up. We are still onboarding. Uh, 
today morning, we got a B2B um, booking for our customers, which means 16 plus artists will be playing first week of December and we've generated uh, some sort of income for these artists as well. Um, our early validation has been achieved already from city uh, councils and HKR customers, and we have launched our MVP this week itself. Um, and going forward, we want to um, validate our MVP, get the product market fit, revenue model fit right, correct, if there are any changes needs to be done release new features so that we can optimize the customer experience and then focus on the experience-led technology. Um, so the, the last bit that I want to um, add here is our vision is to change how Australia experiences the live music industry and we can unturn the damage which has been done by COVID in this particular industry. Thank you. Thanks so much, Neil. Um, I think it's a great problem to solve for, for really great people in a vulnerable community um, through COVID with, with not that many live events. I'm just interested to know who you think um, your main competitors are for a music booking marketplace and, and how do you differentiate? Absolutely. Um, so our main competitors would be um, uh, in Australia. Uh, the people who are offering um, the live on-demand um, live streaming, which is uh, like um, Geeksters, Giggle, Geeksters, Giggle, um, and even ASTASCA. But it is not unified enough to have uh, you know, consolidated musicians under one platform, which makes our platform unique, and which is why I'm saying that we have the first mover advantage in Australia alone. Great, thank you. Um, I'm keen to know a little bit about your revenue model a bit more. Did I read that right? It was so you take 22% per transaction. Uh, that's that's correct. Yep, great. And is there the plan to go for once-off payments if I wanted to hire an artist a once-off, or is it going to just be that I have to sign up for the three-month subscription? So the subscription model is only for a B2B customers mm -hmm. because they usually do a bulk booking and um, uh, for an ongoing basis, 22% per uh, artist might not be conducive for them, mm. but our B2C model remains the same, which is 22% um, throughout. Cool. Okay, thanks. That's it. Any other questions? Oh, great. Thank you. I think Neil just literally solved my wedding band problem <laughs> right there. Um, my next startup is amazing, Sonia. Her background is accounting. She's, she's an accountant. But she, from the time I met her at the beginning of RMIT till now, she, ha she is inspiring. She's going to be talking to you about blockchain and NFTs. How exciting is that? And she has, I have seen her grow from the time she started, from where she was to what she's going to present to you today and it's very, very exciting. Sonia, take it away. Thanks, Shamila. Hi, I'm Sonia from Mount Token. Do you think this is theft? The artist, Winston Walford does. He and his family have been painting these designs for thousands of years, and Wish.com have come along, cut, copy, and pasted it, and put it onto a jumper. That's stolen property. Artists often experience breaches of intellectual property. 80% of tourist product is fake. The pandemic has also caused problems for artists, with 81% of artists earning less than $25,000. But blockchain can solve this. Artists can store their work as a non-fungible token, or NFT. This way, it will be immutable and secure. But how do we get our artists to understand and, and embrace blockchain technology? It's confusing. We need to demystify it. So we're creating a solution. It's a platform that's simple. It has a collaboration space, an NFT marketplace, and an education service. So artists and galleries can onboard and create new projects, access new markets, and develop new skills. There's no other Australian competitor to like it. The time to do this is now. There are $11 billion worth of NFT sales just this year, and the demand is high. There are more buyers than sellers. There are 15,000 buyers and only 10,000 sellers. Melbourne is perfectly positioned to be the world's leader with our great ecosystem of galleries and artists. And this will have massive social impact. 
artists will be able to have financial security, they'll have better mental health, they'll be able to protect their work on the blockchain for the rest of their lives. That means they'll also receive royalties on secondary sales forever. This is long-standing social impact. This is Jasmine Mainsbridge. She's a single mum with five kids. She pays her bills with NFTs. The business model has several revenue streams and this is to mitigate against cryptocurrency risk. The revenue will come mostly from fees and income and then also from commission of sales, subscription model which is pay as you grow and projects and education. The revenue streams are designed to scale and grow as adoption of Web3 increases. There are new collector markets growing in the US and Asia and Australian artists are highly sought after. Four Australian artists were showcased in Times Square just last week. The RMIT activator, I've gone deep into the discovery mode and interviewed 50 galleries, artists and clients. I've also developed my growth mindset and developed an MVP that embodies both a social impact and a strong business model. I've been lucky enough to be chosen to be an industry partner with the Victorian Chamber of Commerce who are supporting the build of the platform, which will be completed by the end of March, after which I've got a go-to-market strategy that includes education and events. I'll then be seeking investment to hire staff to target the international collector markets. I'll leave you with some final thoughts. Mark Zuckerberg has hired 10,000 staff to create his metaverse and virtual world. The JPEG in the middle was bought for $176 in January and sold for $9.5 million just last month. Artist Jenna Lee is an Indigenous artist from Mars Gallery, one of the first galleries I'll be working with. Don't you think she deserves to be part of this digital renaissance? Let's go change the world, one JPEG at a time, or as they say in crypto, wag me, we're all going to make it. Thank you so much, Sonia. Um, very interesting space, also new to myself. Okay. Um, I guess I just wanted to clarify that is there less risk of a company such as Wish taking this IP and putting images from artists' work onto their clothing because of the fact that it is um, I don't know, trademarked as an NFT? I'm probably using the wrong terminology, but as soon as that becomes an NFT, does that risk is now removed of what is currently happening still happening? Yeah, pretty much. I mean, basically the IP will be protected. It's on the blockchain, so it's undisputable. It's immutable. Mm -hmm. So any design, it's there, everyone can see it. It's completely transparent, so everywhere around the world can see that that particular file owns, is owned by that person. Got it, excellent. Um, excellent, so I guess essentially for the artists, it becomes a new revenue stream for them that they jump onto the platform uh, and can create design, yep. or they've already got images that they can turn into NFTs, uh, and it's a new revenue stream for otherwise what they might be selling as hard copy physical work. Yeah, exactly, precisely that. Great, thank you. Yeah, it's such an interesting use of this technology and thanks so much for presenting it. I'm, I'm interested to know your opinion on kind of what is driving the um, the shift towards, um, as, as Millicent point, pointed out, the, the shift towards using NFTs to verify this. Is it primar primarily going to be regulation driven and enabling um, IP lawyers to, to very easily identify the, the link between artist and end product or is it going to be more consumer driven or a combination of both? I think it's actually both. Uh, what we're finding now is that there is definitely a cultural shift. Like it used to be this culture definitely with Web2, which is right click save. If you want an image, you just save it or download it or whatever and then you can just reproduce it wherever you like. I think now with Web3, people stop. They think, oh, well, actually people will know that I've stolen that image because they can see it's owned by someone else. So definitely it's cultural and it will be across the board and it will happen within the next 10 years. Absolutely, 100%. Amazing, thanks. <laughs> okay. You're welcome. All right. My next um, startup founder is Michelle. She might be the last, but not the least. Michelle has actually inspired me. Um, she comes with a startup based on her very own lived experience. And it's really touching a segment of the market that is close to a lot of people's heart and probably not being focused on, um, you know, and not being given enough attention to. I'll let Michelle tell you all about it. Hi, I'm Michelle Ridsdale and I'm founder of Tribe Finder. Did you know that one in 70 kids in Australia have autism? And often kids with autism feel alone with no sense of belonging. 
More than half have difficulty with social interactions and finding friends, and one in five say they've been bullied online. This all leads to a sense of loneliness, and suicide is the number one cause of death in kids under the age of 17. In fact, in 2020, 100 kids died of suicide, and the rate of suicide in kids with autism is three times higher. I've seen this firsthand as my son Nick has autism, and he's experienced online bullying and social isolation. This has all led to episodes of self-harm. While we continue to let our, our young people sign up to social media without a verified identity, we continue to put them at risk. There are no other solutions for kids with or without autism to find and interact with friends safely. So I'm on a mission to change this. Our solution is a social app for kids with autism 13 to 18 to find and interact with friends safely. When you sign up, you'll need a verified identity and parental approval. We'll have AI to monitor for cyberbullying and you'll nominate your special interests, your age and your location and from there you'll be matched with people with the same criteria. You can create various tribes, for example, mountain biking, gaming or coding. Our social impact goal is to improve uh, the mental health and uh, connectedness through friendships and employment. By helping our kids find friends with the same special interests, we can enable a reduction in loneliness and youth suicide. And by developing social skills, we'll also be able to provide em uh, employment opportunities in the future. The business model we intend to test is a monthly membership fee, initially starting at $10 per month, increasing to 15 as we have new features. Our projected revenue in 24 months is $700,000 per quarter. Parents I've spoken to have said they can't wait for the app to be released and would pay anything to keep their kids safe online. And this is from parents uh, of kids without autism. We had a goal of having 10 users registered on the platform at the time of launch. We already have 30 registered with new registrations coming each day. And through our research, we believe the product can be expanded to other ages and disabilities, including adults. Our plan is to launch the MVP next week, gather more feedback from our users and prove out the value. We intend to apply for seed funding early next year and through, once we have the network effect, we'll implement the monthly membership fee and we'll internationalise from there. What I've, I've learned is I definitely need somebody technical to help me out. Um, I'd also like to say a huge thank you to uh, the judges uh, to the RMIT Activator Program who've helped me stay really focused, um, focus on my purpose and my social impact and accelerate my product to market. Thank you. Um, that was amazing. Thank I you. particularly like that your 2023 goal was to slay. Um, I think you're already doing that, it was great. <laughs> Um, I'm really interested, you, you've got on there to do um, some pre-seed funding. Where do you envision, oh, how much do you plan on raising an SMA and where do you plan on spending that money? Yeah, we are, we've got an MVP ready to launch, uh, but it is really very basic. So we'll need funding to build out a lot of the security, which is our key feature. Mm -hmm. uh, also the matching. Uh, so at the moment, we've got 30 users who are sort of spread around Australia actually, but we need a little bit more uh, technology and we also plan to integrate with uh, Utopia, which is an AI solution um, to help with the cyberbullying. Uh, so we'll, we'll need to raise funds, you know, to, to kind of build the next version. I know a few investors already um, through my network because I've worked in tech for over 10 years as a, a CPO, so I'm just trying to tap into those at the moment. Amazing. Thank you. Yeah, amazing platform. Thanks so much for the presentation. Um, my question is around, um, it seems like this is a really great tool for connecting people in a community with, with one another. Yes. Um, and my question is, once you've made those connections, um, how do you retain people on the platform paying that monthly fee once they've found a couple of people in their community? Yeah, look, I, I think, you know, like any friendship group, you know, you're often looking for somebody to do something different with. So, uh, so by creating tribes, whether it's, you know, going for a mountain bike ride with somebody in your local area or, you know, playing games, um, you're always kind of looking for those new people. Um, and so, and we'll also have some other features in the app as well around 
uh, teaching kids social skills and those sorts of things that, um, and build out the features in, in that way. Fantastic. Thanks. No worries. Thank you. Wow, it's all done. That's all the pictures for tonight. Um, but please stay with us. There's still more to come. Our judges will now go and deliberate just off to my left here before we announce who has won the best pitch. But that's not all because we need your help at home. In the meantime, the People's Choice Award um, voting is still open. Make sure you vote for your favourite startup. Up at, um, up at the link in the chat box to your right. It's going to go. It's going to be closing in a few minutes. What an impressive cohort! It's going to be tough to choose who takes our honours in the awards tonight. Um, before we announce our winners, I would like to invite Eugenia to the stage. She is our community and startup coordinator at RMIT Activator, and she will talk about the next Launch Hub cohort and the, all the upcoming events that RMIT, Acti RMIT Activator is going to have. <laughs> Thanks a lot, Tim. Um, I guess this is where everyone can sit back and relax, and this is my turn to get nervous. <laughs> so, and before I dive into Launch Up 12, um, I have a few kudos to give, and I know Matt already um, shared his thanks, but you know, uh, a little bit more love wouldn't hurt. So, first of all, I would like to thank our coaches, Ian, Shamila, and Sangeeta, for the amazing support that you have provided to our founders. I know um, often this involves candid conversations where you have to say things to our founder that they may not necessarily want to hear, but absolutely need to hear. <laughs> so thanks a lot for that authenticity, that transparency, and wanting the absolute best for our founders. I would like to thank our judges who are here today, who has now gone into the room to deliberate. Um, so there will be Charlie and Millie and also Katie for sharing their insights and feedback, which uh, we will share with our founders afterwards and for also asking really insightful questions. Also would like to extend my thanks to our program partner, um, Circular Economy Victoria, Luna, and also our program supporters, Blue Rock. I would like to thank our whole Activator team, especially my lovely colleagues who are here today, Steph, Sukanya, Damini, and Juan. You guys are the key to the smooth running of the program and this showcase. I'd like to thank Tim as well. You're almost like a member of our Activator team and good job with the MC. I would like to say to our founders, good job. I know in our last week's stand-up meeting, uh, a few of you have mentioned that you know this program has ended up being a lot more intense than <laughs> what you have imagined. But I also know that many of you have mentioned that this has been a tremendously rewarding journey and you have actually even surprised yourselves on how far that you have traveled in this program. I know that people often look at startups you know, with rosy glasses, they think it's cool, they think it's sexy. You often see big numbers floating around in millions. But I know as a federal founder myself that you know, the startup journey is actually full of sweat and tears. You often have to step out of your comfort zone. You have to pivot, you have to reiterate and things almost never go as planned. So that's why here, before we announce the judges, for ten, uh, the judges, sorry, the, the prizes, the winners for tonight, I would like to say to you that every single one of you tonight is a winner for what you have achieved in the last 12 weeks and also for all the challenges and obstacles that you have overcome during the program, which have now transformed you. So please give yourselves a big round of applause. <laughs> and last but not least, Launch Up 12 application is now open. And once again, we're supporting impact, social impact ventures. We have lots of exciting opportunities available in growth, mentorship, and also funding. The application link will be in the chat box now. So please, once you click on the link, you'll find out everything about the program and don't hesitate to apply or share with people around you whom you think might benefit from the program. So that's it from me. I think I've held the suspense long enough now. Um, I'll back to the, Tim to announce the winners. Yeah, we, we have it ready. We've got one winner ready. Ooh, yeah. awesome. Right. <laughs> Thanks, Eugenia. <laughs> All right, so we have some results. Um, the moment I can hear the judges just in one of the other rooms, they're just still deciding on who is going to be the winner of the best pitch of the night. However, I do have the results for the People's Choice Award. Thank you so much for voting at home. 
um, while you're watching the live stream tonight. We had an outstanding number of votes come through for the People's Choice Award and well done to all the founders once again. But the winner for the, uh, for the People's Choice Award is Wadu. Congratulations. Yeah, really, really um, well deserved. Um, a, a really amazing pitch. And I think uh, we can all attest that we've, um, back when Pokemon Go, I think was a huge craze, we saw it happen all over the city. And I think, um, yeah, it's, it's a really important mission that I think the team are on to get people back around Melbourne City and hopefully other cities around the world. Um, so congratulations to Wadu. Um, we still have the judges uh, deliber deliberating on who is going to win the best pitch of the night. I think I can hear them coming through soon, but um, as you can see, there's been some really, really amazing pitches, and I think some businesses already getting some runs on the board. Um, but I'm just going to take the time as we kind of still have the judges just deliberating. Oh, they're just coming back through now. Just be one second. Okay, now to announce the winner. Thanks so much, judges. I know that was, would have been a pretty hard choice. So, but yeah, it's, it's time to announce the winner of the best pitch tonight by our judges here that, um, from some of our, our partner our businesses. Thank you again to all three of you um, to have the difficult decision of nominating a winner. But the winner of our best pitch tonight is La Guapa Out Outwear. Congratulations. <laughs> All right, I'm just going to find where I'm at. <laughs> so that's it for the prizes. It's on to um, closing uh, t tonight's event. Uh, it's been really fantastic hearing from all the founders tonight. Thank you so much for joining us at, at home on the live stream. But I'd also like to thank our three judges, Charlie McDonald from Giant Leap, uh, Katie Higgins from Luna, Millicent Brealey from Blue Rock. Thank you so much. Our coaches so important in this program. We've had some people that have come back to do, uh, you know, who have done multiple pro programs before. So it really speaks to your commitment. And uh, so Ian Wong, thank you so much. Sangeeta Mulchandani, uh, thank you so much. And Shamila Gopalan, thank you. Uh, yep, just there. Thank you so much. Thank you to our fantastic founders. As I said, uh, to this co uh, in this cohort for their hard work. It's a really massive achievement to get this far and to make it through one of these programs. So congratulations to you. We'd also like to give a big shout out to some of our program partners, uh, Circular Economy Victoria and Luna, and as well as our supporters, Blue Rock and Cake Equity. To everyone watching tonight, thank you again for coming along to the Launch Hub Showcase today. Uh, it's been an honor being your host and to, um, have a great night. And to those, of this, to, to those of you who will be joining us after the event, I look forward to seeing you down at the Oxford Scholar. Uh, and to everyone else, have a great weekend. Thanks so much, everyone.